Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Now, when we speak about fear through this message this week and next week, we can talk about the simplest fear going anywhere from a little bit of worry and apprehension all the way to fear and dread that we might have in our life. And sometimes in a course of a week, it can go back and forth. Sometimes in the course of our life, even as a Christian, no matter how old we are in the Lord and how we're growing in the Lord, we too can have bouts with that. Our fears often begin when we're very young, like the keiki that we're here today. They start out with fearing the darkness or monsters. And then when you get into teenagers, they fear such things as failure, broken relationships, perhaps things in their life where they feel like they'd be rejected. And then you get into older age, they just multiply even more. They feel such things as the fear of disease, death, financial problems, broken relationships, loved ones being hurt, storms, failure, aging, crime, All these things that might be happening to them. So there's a tremendous amount of fear that goes on as well. And so it doesn't matter what age you are, you can have these. After the service last Sunday, I was chatting with a lady who was just sharing with me a very interesting statement. She said, I'm not really afraid of death. I'm really afraid of life. And I thought that was interesting that sometimes Christians, they're not afraid of death because they know they're going to go to heaven when they die. But they might be afraid of things in life and even how they will die. And so you might be in that stage today. A number of months ago, maybe six, eight weeks, two months ago, I asked you to give to me information about what you think might be fearful in your world. And we covered those five significant areas from what you are fearful of, and we showed you the lie. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I'd like for us to realize that when we have fear in our life, often it's because we have quit focusing really upon the Lord. In fact, fear can be so dangerous that when we have fear, it will choke out God's word in our life. And that becomes the paradox. Because when we have fear, we can't get into God's word like we'd like to because we're so fearful at times. And yet it's God's word, it's very self that will alleviate the fear that we have. So what we have to do sometimes is by his power and strength and by our choice is to plow through that and get back into God's word and not allow that fear to strangle us as it has done so much. So today what I'd like to do is I want to answer the question about fearing the Lord and how that we can discover God through our fears. Now we know that Job in the Bible said that his greatest fears came upon him. And so we think that what we fear, that's going to happen to us. Often it is because the sovereign God permits that which we're fearing to come to us. So then at that time, we'll become broken and we'll go to him so that he can then show us through his word that we really didn't need to fear those things. And so sometimes through fear, it could actually draw us much closer to the Lord. Let's look at those five significant categories of fear. And then we're going to look at those five lies one more time as a review for those folks who weren't able to be with us last week. If you will, take out your worship folder and your outline because we're going to be following that. I encourage you to open up your Bible, put it open on your lap. If you want to, you can get out a pen. So I want to speak to you first, but then I'd also like to come alongside you hoping to give you some kind of truths that you can use when you mentor your children. Those of you that are in a counseling or disciple relationship with someone else, especially when they share with you the fears that they have as well. And you'll be surprised how many people do struggle with that. So let's look at the first fear, the fear of death. What's the lie? My security is in this life. The fear of rejection. Worth comes from people. The fear of safety. God may not do what's best. Fear of poverty. God won't take care of me. And finally, the fear of suffering. I won't be able to bear it. Now what you're going to find on your worship folder sheet in front of you, and those of you that are on the radio, you can order this. You can download it off our website if you'd like. But let me go through these because I didn't want you to have to fill in the blank. So I want you to lean into this. Those of you that are new on your journey with the Lord, you're going to feel like this is almost information overload. And so I'm going to try to make it clear as simple as I can, because I believe that the more information that you have in a clear way will actually take you to another level with the Lord, and especially those of you who want to grow. So what I've done now is I've taken those five significant fears that we face. Then what I've done is I've divided that by giving you three solutions. The first one is going to be the name of God, so that when you have that fear, you're going to learn what is the name of God in it. Then I've selected an attribute of God, and then finally, a memory verse. 
Now, what I'd like to encourage you to do, those of you that want to go further with your Bible knowledge, is take these five fears, take these five names of God, take these five attributes, and continue adding more verses to these so that you'll have an invariable uh, 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 toolbox full of biblical verses that will address that fear. You might not need it today. You might need it next week with a friend of yours. So again, I want to equip you to help reach other people. Let's follow along together, shall we? You might take them maybe a week at a time and meditate on these. The first one would be the fear of death. So the name of God would be Jehovah Yasha. And that simply means God who saves. So I want you to know that it's not God who wants to squash you like a bug and cast you into hell. Yes, he is holy. And yes, we are condemned unless we're part of his forever family by grace alone. But I want you to know his desire is to save us. So what is his attribute? His attribute would be gracious or merciful. I want you to see a God who loves you unconditionally just the way you are, and it's manifested in his grace and his mercy, and it's done on the cross. Look, if you will, at Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and here's what you read, the scripture. He saved us, not because of the good things we did, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins and gave us new life through the Holy Spirit. My, what a powerful verse. So those of you that are now struggling with the fear of death because you don't know if you're going to go on the other side to a a wonderful place called heaven. Simply this verse is saying that God loves you so much that he will now take away anything that would be separating you from him in an earthly relationship now and an eternal relationship in heaven. And he will do it by his blood, his death, his resurrection. He's done the work and he says, I will give you eternal life in the person of my son, If you would simply trust my son as God, the Lord, who died and rose again, I will grant you forgiveness. The neat part, it is not by any good deeds we do. So going to heaven is not by good works. It's not by good works and and, uh, um, and trusting Christ. It is only by trusting in Jesus Christ. It is his mercy, his grace. He's the Savior. He's Jehovah Yasha. So there's no need to fear. Own that. Meditate on it. Believe it. Rest in it. All right, the second one would be the fear of rejection. Now, I know a lot of times we're more concerned with what other people would think of us, whether it's rejection on getting on a team or a squad or getting voted for something or maybe get a promotion or something in your life that you don't want to be rejected in a relational way. Well, the name of God would be Jehovah Shammah. Would you say that out loud with me? Jehovah Shammah. Now, when you see that, I want you to know it means the Lord who is there. And I like that because when someone rejects you, often they will forsake you or abandon you or marginalize you or distance themselves from you. But when you look at the Lord, I want you to know there is no rejection with the Lord when you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. So that's why we started with death. Once that's removed, you have eternal life and you will never be rejected. Notice the attribute of God is that means he's everywhere present. That means he won't leave you and the beauty of it is you can't leave him. Now, let me give you parentheses. When you walk away from the Lord as a Christian, in other words, you choose to to make choices in your life that are not honoring to him, you begin to grieve the spirit and maybe even quench the spirit. You won't grieve or quench him away from you. In other words, you will lose your salvation. But you could almost feel like you are. And there's a passage of scripture that says that if you don't add to your faith good things, not to stay saved, but if you don't build on that faith that you have, you could even forget that you were saved to start with. And so I wanted you to know that you will not be separated from the Lord. He will always be there. But don't always count on it being a feeling as well. Let's look at the verse, a promise. It says this in Hebrews 13. God has said, love it, I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. Some verses, versions say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, this is a God who cannot lie. That is why we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I won't be afraid, underline that. What can mere mortals do to me? And I've given you a whole lot of other verses. Do you recall last week one of the most poignant little remarks on the card of people having fear was this one? It's the one that really struck me personally the most when they said, I fear abandonment. And if you recall, I shared with that person, if you were listening or if that person was here who filled that out, that the Lord will never abandon you. I pray we as a church will never abandon you, but you have to let us come alongside you to let you know that we can be tested and you'll find us to try to present Christ to you. But when we can't, and I hope I'm not giving an excuse to Satan, but when a pastor can't be there for you, I want you to know the Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You will never be rejected. Do not judge God by the relationships that have rejected you in the past. 
In the version that says he will never leave you nor forsake you, when it says he never leaves you, means he won't say goodbye to you. When someone forsakes you, that means I'm never coming back again. That's why it says I will never leave you nor forsake you. The third great fear is the fear of safety. And we can feel that sometimes. I remember one time when I heard such a roar outside my window. I was a young boy. I woke my dad up trying to wake the family up. And we were, what is this noise? We haven't ever heard this. We grew up in Miami and you don't have tornadoes. You have hurricanes. Hurricanes you can prepare for. Tornadoes you can't. The roar was so loud. We went to the front door. My dad and I looked at ourselves. Do we get our family? Do we run outside? Do we find something? There's no basement in our house. And so while we're talking about what we're going to do, the tornado ripped through the neighborhood. We were spared. It destroyed the houses next to us, and it lifted right above our house. I don't know why. Nobody was killed, praise the Lord. But there is a fear of safety that we all will go through, whether it's an uh, impending automobile accident or something else. So who would be the Lord that would help you? He would be Jehovah Sabaoth. Now, that's a hard name to pronounce, but let's see if you can do it with me. Jehovah Sabaoth. Say it with me. Jehovah Sabaoth. Now, that means the Lord of hosts. Now, you say, what in the world does that mean, the Lord of hosts? Well, if I was to say we have a host of desserts here, you would be saying, wow, that means we have a wonderful array of desserts. And if I say we have a host of people here today, you'd say, wow, what a great group of people that we have. Well, he is the Lord not of host. He is the Lord of hosts. So what would be this many things he's the Lord of? If you take it through scripture, which I don't have time to unpack all of this, you would find that it would be his heavenly warring angels. And I'm putting the word warring in there in the sense that those angels have been designed by God to serve us so that we would then be brought closer to the Lord. So he is the Lord, the commander of all those angels to provide a ministry to us of perhaps protection mostly. Now, here's the key thing. Many Christians are starting to understand that. Some of them go off the deep end and they begin to worship the angels because they're the protectors. Let me remind you of something. Whatever any angel does, he does it by the permission of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. So our worship is still of him and for him and to him for what he does by providing these hosts. So I want you to know you have angels. Now, some of us probably lost some of our angels because we live too close to the edge. But That's a joke. But I do want you to know God will take care of you. I have to tell you that sometimes. I'm not very funny. But if you will look at the uh, particular attribute of the Lord, he is powerful and he is sovereign. You've heard me say this a lot, that God is large and in charge, and he really is. He is sovereign, but he is also someone who's powerful. I I think of the word sovereign, that means he has the right to do anything he wants to do by prescription or by permission. He is God. He can do that. But he's also, besides being sovereign, he has the power to perform it. So some people, and you know this, that have been out in the world of work, you can be given a title, so you have the title of sovereignty, but you don't have the authority to function in that role. I won't ask you to raise your hand. And you know how frustrating that is. It is not that way with the Lord. He is perfectly sovereign. He is perfectly powerful. And I love this. He is perfectly love. So whatever he does in that world, it's born on his character trait also of love. Look at the, the uh, attribute of uh, the uh, memory verse, Psalm 4, 8. The psalmist says, I will lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. You might want to mark that in your Bible. Now, that doesn't mean you throw open the doors and you invite all the neighbors to come in while you're asleep at night. It does mean that you might put up the alarm, etc. But it is saying this, that no matter what you might do to provide safety for your family, ultimately the one who is the safe keeper is going to be the Lord, and he will do it often through his hosts of angels. Let's go to number four, the fear of poverty. Now, I don't know that we had that fear unless you lived during the Great Depression as much. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Then you have those that have really watched the big boom through the years. I know it kind of dropped a little bit in the early 80s when we were paying so high interest rates, etc. But I think right now we're suffering and probably will suffer even greater financial loss, particularly those of you who have made some investments that we really thought were pretty good. And historically they have been good, but now we're not so sure. So you might be afraid of a little bit of poverty. Some of you might not even want to go into missions because you're afraid if you get out into these fields and it's almost a vow of poverty and how will Christians be able to support you if they can't even take care of their own needs now? So I don't want to do this. I want you to know, be careful of the lie of Satan because where God guides, God provides. Do I hear an amen? Where God leads, God feeds. Now, you've got to work smart. You've got to be prayerful. Please be holy and separate for him because he much prefers to use a pure vessel. 
Now that being the case, don't worry about the poverty because the name of God is Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. Now what's so exciting about this, what he provided as the first illustration, was a ram caught in the thicket so that a boy would not have to be slain so that we can continue with this, uh, uh, the nation of Israel as a promise of the Lord. So what's the attribute of God? Goodness and kindness. I really like that because even in our poverty, we think of how bad we might have it. Just remember, we all could be living in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, in the deepest part of the jungle. Do I hear an amen on that? So we don't really have it so bad. And I don't want to minimize your pain because it is tough when you don't know if you're going to be able to pay the bill at the end of your month. And it's tough. But God is good and he is kind. Here's your verse, Philippians 4.19. Wonderful passage after Paul already said he knew how to have a lot of money, a lot of stuff. And he knew also how, how to have very little, like a, like a Ferris wheel going up and down. He knew how to be on top, but he also knew how to be on the bottom. And he said this, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches. I love saying that. Say it with me. Glorious riches. He gives that to me. Everything that God gave to Christ, he's given to us because we're in Christ, which have been given to us in Christ. There you have it. So don't ever worry about it. If you can trust the Lord for your salvation, you certainly can trust him for a hamburger. He'll take care of you. Number five, fear of suffering. Fear of suffering. Now, um, this can be very real to some people because we don't know what suffering is like. We don't know what our threshold will be like. And um, I always grieve for those when I hear that they're in a lot of pain. I don't do pain well. I do think, and this is my opinion, and it's like an armpit. We all have them. They all stink. But here's my opinion. I think women can handle more suffering than men can. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. And, you, and you guys, are, you're laughing right now, I, I know, but let me tell you something. Aren't you glad we don't have to birth a baby? Let's leave that alone. Okay, so no matter what, you can show me your scar, I'll show you my scar. I don't care what you've gone through suffering. Some of it can be very, very fearful when we have it. And I'd like you to know Jehovah Shalom. Now, what I, you're thinking, well, why didn't he give Jehovah Rapha, God who heals? Because sometimes he will not heal you. At that time. And the real healing is the healing you really want anyway. You want an eternal healing so you don't go to hell and have eternal life. Amen? So that's the best healing of all. But here's what you do want during the suffering. You want to have the peace of God. And I love that. And his attribute is peace, of course. And of course the scripture is, each time the Lord said, each time the Lord said, my gracious favor or grace is all you need. Now, it helps to have some pain medication, I know. But even when you're going through all of that and the uncertainty of when you'll get out of it, my grace is all you need. You've got to believe that. My power works best in your weakness. And in the parentheses, I could also say, and it's all about my power, not your weakness that matters. So now I, Paul, am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Why? so that the power of Christ may work through me. Sometimes the lower you go, the higher he goes. And so maybe for that moment you can do it. And if anything might help you, and I don't throw it in my face. I know I might, might not be suffering like you are, your loved ones are, but I can tell you this. No matter how much you suffered, never forget the extent of the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm sometimes wondering, you know, if blood, and it is, not if, possibly, maybe not, if, and it is, that it was blood that needed to be shed on the cross and then death comes from that, Jesus could have died a, a almost painless death by a slice on an artery and bled all over the ground and then come back to life again. Apart from the prophecies that said that he would have to be crucified in Zechariah, I know that, but let me go with this. I'm wondering in God's design was that he permitted, perhaps prescribed, this most horrific, horrendous human body shredding experience that Jesus went through with the abandonment of everyone and anyone before he even died so that he could then say, at all points, I went through it as you did. And whatever you go through, I've been there with you and probably even went further. And so when you're going through this suffering for that moment, if it's a back problem, he was on the cross with his back. If it's arms and legs, it was that. If it was head, it was that. The piercing came, I believe, after he was dead. But I know this, he was shredded all over through that whipping of the lictor at that time. So the suffering, you can still have peace. 
So, what I want to talk now about is on focusing on God. And if you don't mind, I want to step away for a moment because I want to give you some more of my opinion here. Then we're going to go back into the Word. Um, you're, you've heard last week. You're hearing this week. Next week, I want to cover more about the fear of God and how do you, what's the proper fear you need to have. But come back to this. You'll hear me a lot say that when you're going through whatever level of fear, you must focus on God. Some people will hear that as a sound bite, and so they'll, they'll amen that, they'll agree with that, and what they'll do is they'll think, if I put up placards of the name of the Lord, or I could take what you wrote here, Pastor, and I'll put all those up on the refrigerator and, and all of that. All of that is good. Better than just God, put His name. Better than just His name, go to His attribute. More than just His attribute, go to the Word. But here's, what I, here's where I'm going to go. It's not the icons that are going to give you the peace. It's not going to be all the banners and all the stuff, the paraphernalia, even the name of God that you can have. Now, they're great reminders. And there are people that almost feel like they cannot connect with God unless they go into a building that's called a sanctuary that's just loaded with all these icons and, and images that might be there. And I'm not going to put that down. I'm just going to caution you strongly that if you use so many of these things, then when you're not around those things, they became the crutch and not the inner relationship you have with the Lord by meditating on His Word and letting Him transform you from within. So you might use them occasionally as a brief momentary reminder. But our church is not any further away from the Lord if this cross up on the wall fell down or someone stole it on a Saturday night. Do I hear an amen on that? So, I don't, do I hear an amen on that? Think about it at least. At least think about it because I don't want to drive you to icons. I don't want to drive you to mere placards. And if you have them in your house, that's great. We have them in ours. But at the same time, don't use those as your only crutch. It has got to be taking the word in your mind so it goes into your soul that begins to change you through your body. So now this, this, this courage that you have is totally from him and not a man-made crutch. That being said, now what I'd like... Oh, by the way, if you need some reminders of that, I'm thinking of Peter, if you recall, when he was uh, called to come out of the boat, he came out of the boat, there was a lot of storms, okay, so he was fearful, he was looking at the Lord, then he took his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink, and when he got his eyes back up on the Lord, things were better and the Lord took care of him. Bottom line is, he focused on the Lord. Isaiah says, I will, keep, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on the Lord. And then Philippians says that if we take all of our petitions to the Lord, he will give us the peace that will guard our hearts. So again, it's focusing on the Lord. And so the way we do that is you have the, the living Christ, of course, and that's an, a, a relationship you have with Him. But then you also have the written word right here. And the best way, watch this, the best way to know that you're worshiping the correct living Lord is to have the correct understanding of the written Lord, the written word right here in your heart. Okay, you're probably wondering, why am I speaking so fast? Because that clock just goes faster on Sunday mornings than any time during the week. You know, it's terrible, it's terrible. All right. And, I, and I'm only on page three of my notes, okay? So you want to know how many more pages do you have? I have 29. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Coming up for air, but now I want to go back to Psalm 27. Psalm 27, although there are a lot of verses in Scripture that will help you about fear, if you had to park on one psalm and you only wanted to go through one psalm, I would say read Psalm 27 as often as you can, memorize it, meditate, and get a, get a good uh, translation of it so you have a good understanding of what it is for you. Are you still with me? Because I've got to go off on another tangent for a moment. I've got to. Because I don't want to warp you here, and it's so hard to do this in a, in, a, in a preaching time, and you don't have a lot of time. I gave you five fears. I think pretty much they're all in there. They might be said differently. But here's the danger. It's not those five fears. The danger is I gave you five names of God, five attributes of God, and basically five passages of Scripture. I don't want you to put God in such a tight box that it's just that verse, that name, that attribute with that fear. I want you to know it's all of His names. He's like a diamond, and sometimes that diamond will spark, sparkle one way to you to another. So it's all of God to whatever one fear that you have. But you've got to know Him and own Him. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Now, that being said, Psalm 27, if you had to park on one and only own one, and your Bible got to fall off the back of the car and it got shredded and you can only have one psalm, Psalm 27 would be the one you would want to have. So let's look at these quickly. All right, first of all, the Lord protects me from danger. I will take the time to read the word here. The Lord protects me from danger. It says this in verse 1. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord protects me from danger. So why should I tremble? Well, there's three things in this one little verse that I want to draw your attention to, and you can mark them in your Bible if you want to. The first is this. It says, God is my light. Now, I know He is light. We know about it in Scripture. There's a lot I can say about the Shekinah glory and all of that. But I would rather speak to the issue of 
when we feel like we're lost, when we're kind of consumed by the fear, because that's the context of the scripture here, we feel like we're, we've lost direction. What do we do? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do in the future? What's going to happen to us? It's like we are, we're, we're in the dark at that particular time. And so when it says the Lord is my light, it's very important it's because he wants to shed his wisdom, his light on that situation. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Make it clear.